How's your conscience? I'll ask you a question again a couple of times. What is a conscience? A little girl replied, it's my grandmother. A little boy replied, it's something that makes you tell your mother before your sister does. Webster's Dictionary says, a conscience is a sense of moral goodness or blame of one's own conduct, intentions, or character, together with a feeling of obligation to do right or be good. Your conscience. Everyone has a conscience. 2 Corinthians 4.2 says, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. Is the conscience the voice of God created within humans? It can't be. Because sometimes our conscience leads us to do the wrong thing. Things that are contrary to Scripture. The word conscience does not appear in the Old Testament. But there's a word in the Old Testament which substitutes for conscience, and that's the word heart. The word conscience appears 31 times in the New Testament, and occasionally the word heart is used. But 31 times in the New Testament, and that's where, by and large, I'm going to get the source for our text this morning. Should we follow the adage that says, always let your conscience be your guide? And the answer is no. And you'll find out why as we go along. This morning, I I, I pose that question, how's your conscience? And the Bible describes your conscience in seven ways, seven stages, if you will. Number one, the Bible describes a conscience as evil and it also uses a word seared. We'll look at it. Secondly, the conscience is described as convicted. Third, as purged. Fourth, as pure. Fifth, as weak. Sixth, as good. Seven, as void of offense. And you can use the shorthand clear, a clear conscience. Number one, an evil conscience. What's that all about? Well, just turn on your TV and look around and see how people are operating. Crimes on the rise in America. In almost all of the major cities, they've got a real problem with it. And we look at the kind of crime that goes on and it just seems it's unbelievable. Mass shootings, people are being stabbed on the streets of New York. People are walking along and somebody comes from behind and wow, hits them on the back of the head. People fall down on those concrete uh, streets, hit their heads against the hydrant, and die. People are being pushed downstairs. People are at work in their little bodegas, and somebody comes in and starts demanding that their stuff that they're going to order be given to them freely, and then starts pushing and, and, and beating on the, on the people who are serving them. And when the people who are serving them fight back, they go to jail. Does it make any sense? And we wonder, how could people be doing this? We wonder, what does it take to go down the street and shoot as many people as you can at a parade? Or shoot people in in their own front yard having a barbecue? Little kids get shot and killed. And we wonder, what's going on here? Don't these people have any conscience? Don't they have any shame? Ephesians 4.18 described unsaved humanity as, quote, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Conscience is not working. It's blind to good and evil. There is no shame. 1 Timothy 4.2. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, where we are, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. An evil conscience becomes a dead conscience. There ain't nobody home saying that this is wrong. People are doing things and involved in things today that there's nobody telling them that they can't do it. The pulpits are silence because of it. Politicians don't want to say anything that's not politically correct. And because we're being silent, and because we're not facing it head on, and because we're not being direct about these things, people are thinking it's okay. My conscience is not bothering me. No, yours is dead. 
Truth falls away to lies and hypocrisy. Titus 1.15 says, these folks' minds and conscience are completely defiled. You remember uh, our dear brother who used to say, the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist, Jim Drummond used to say that. Nothing in the spirit of the age today is too dark. Nothing is sacred. There are no rules. There are no boundaries. Everything goes. They say it's all good. It's not all good. Some things are forbidden. But if you're not in this book, if your conscience is not stimulated by this book, then maybe everything does go. Who's to say no? Who sets up the borders? Who sets up the boundaries of conduct in this day in which we live? Folks live without shame, bragging about their sexuality. I don't, I'm not interested. Why do you have to tell me these things? Why do commercials have to promote stuff I'm not interested in? That I think is wrong. Why do we have a culture of death when life is precious according to God? Why do people make excuses for, for killing children in the womb and abusing children on the streets? It's a disrespect for life, all against a backdrop of anger and rage. They're so sure that what they're doing in their own minds is right and celebrated by politicians and people in entertainment and every just about every commercial you see on television, these things are celebrated. There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politically correct nor popular, but one must take it because that person's conscience adheres to God's word and God's word tells them it's the right thing to do. Stand up and speak out. Don't just go along with the crowd. The goal of we believers is found in Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts, our conscience, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. We're not going to go along with the, with the, the time uh, of, 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 our, of our generation. It's not the time to go along. Secondly, a convicted conscience. Paul explains in Romans 2.15, the Gentiles who did not have a written law had a moral law written in their mind. And when they violated that moral code, their conscience gave them a guilt trip. Have you ever had a guilt trip? Maybe it's your conscience speaking. But these folks, they would either acknowledge their wrong or find ways to justify their bad behavior. That's where we are. Either it's going to convict you that you're doing the wrong thing and you'll repent of it, or you're just going to go along and say, hey, I can continue doing this. Now, there's a wonderful example in John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, about a convicted conscience in action. So I'd like you to stand with me as I read it, once I get to it. John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Let's stand. Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came on to him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set their mind in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman has, was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such be stoned. What do you say? And they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not, as though he wasn't listening. So when they continued asking, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none of the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thou, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You may be seated.
Jesus forgives sin. We don't have to live in our past once we confess and repent of our sin. It's our present life that he's looking at. What are you doing now? Where's your conscience? How's your conscience now? Third, a purged conscience. Clean out the garbage. We get bombarded and inundated with all kinds of ideas and, and philosophies and ideologies and one person's. Isn't it curious how one person complain about, can complain about something and everything comes to a stop? If a, if a football coach goes on the end zone after the game and prays with bended knee, one person comes along and says, I don't think that's right. And pretty soon we wind up in the Supreme Court. And thank God, at this time the Supreme Court said, no, that is right. It's okay for him to do that. Amen? Amen. Imagine when praying is outlawed. We're there. Hebrews 9.14, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You have to be proactive because your mind has been influenced. You're inundated with all kinds of godless ideas, all kinds of things that are anti-scripture, and the scripture says something is wrong. Brothers and sisters, it is wrong. Even if the whole world says it's right. Let God be true, and what? Every man a liar. We must come to the place where we recognize the capacity we have for a, for a depraved conscience. Once we recognize our sin and our sinful nature, those convictions lead to repentance. In other words, people don't know they need a Savior unless they realize they're a sinner, unless they realize they're carrying a load of sin on their back, and they want to do something about it. And what is there to do? It's to go to the Lord, come to the foot of the cross, bow your knee and say, Father, I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. Wash away my sin. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose again the third day. Come into my heart. Help me to start my life out of, as a follower of Christ. He'll do it. And you'll be free from your sin, free from the guilt, free from the shame. And your conscience will begin the process of being renewed. It's a process. Some conscience, some for conscience sake have suffered. They've been tortured, loss of property, reputation in life. When you follow your conscience, sometimes you're going to lose friends. When you are following what the Holy Spirit is doing in your, in your life, you might be losing friends because you're coming from a completely different place. Some of you might remember a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Klaus Stauffenberg. Anybody know that name? Well, he's the one that attempted to assassinate Adolf Hitler. And eventually they found out it was him and they, they executed him. But before he was executed, this is what he said at his trial. Better I be a traitor to my country than to my conscience. Than to my conscience. Daily Bible meditation will instruct the conscience about God's will. You've got to be in the book. You've got to be in the book to begin to retrain your conscience. You've got to be in the book in order to reestablish the sensitivity of your conscience. You've got to be in a place where you know the difference between right and wrong. You gotta, you're making choices every day. Young people are making choices every day. And by and large, so many are making the wrong choices. Choices that are wrong are choices that are condemned by Scripture. God will never tell you it's, it's okay to violate his word. Never. Number four, a pure conscience. 1 Timothy 3.9, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. 2 Timothy 1.3, Paul thanks God that he has served him with a pure conscience. How many of us can say that? When we get saved, the process of cleansing and re-energizing the conscience begins, which creates the soil for peace to germinate and flower in our lives. A French proverb reads, there is no pillow so soft as a pure conscience, no matter what Mike Lindell may say. This is the pillow that really helps you to get a good night's sleep. A pure conscience, a clean conscience, a clear conscience. Number five, a weak conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, 7 
speaks of people, quote, whose conscience being weak is defiled. A weak conscience comes from not being in the book. You hardly know what you should do on your own. But God doesn't want you to do it on your own. God doesn't want you to make this fight on your own. He wants you to make this fight with the power of the Holy Spirit, with a clear conscience and a strong conscience based on your knowledge of Scripture. When we have no convictions of God's will, what's right or wrong, what's biblical, what's not biblical, we become vulnerable. We're vulnerable to fall into the world's trap of subtle incrementalism, incremental persuasion. What you thought was wrong, can you go back in your mind a minute? What you thought was wrong 10 years ago, over these last 10 years, the, 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 the influencers in our society, the TV, the commercials, the radio, the music, have all said these things are okay. Has your attitude about them changed? There's a lot of things that were sin 20 years ago that are celebrated today. How could that be? Check your conscience. It's not working. So how does that happen, that we can be susceptible and give in to the subtle ways of the devil? Genesis 3.1 labels Satan as subtle, S-U-B-T-L-E, a word which means delicately suggestive. I like that, delicately suggestive, crafty, shrewd, just like the advertisers from Madison Avenue, subliminal messages, things that you would hardly be offended to, but they're creeping their way into your brain. They're slowly influencing you. They couldn't move you before. You were on the solid rock of conviction. Then very slowly they began to insinuate things. It didn't sound so bad the way they said it. It wasn't as dark as you thought it was. They had a little light shed there. Subtle, crafty, shrewd. In the garden, Satan was a wordsmith, a storyteller, a liar, a tempter, a deceiver. Weak minds and people without strong convictions are his targets. And how many people are there like that? Ignorant. Ask most young people. Name the first four books of the New Testament. And by and large, they can't. Ask adults. How many people sitting in a church today? If they could quote the first four books of the New Testament, wonder what would happen. 1 Peter 5.10, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered, while you make you perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. The Holy Spirit wants to take you and he wants to bring the word into you while you're in a place where you're not sure of what's right and what's wrong. You're not sure of what you believe. You're not sure of what convictions you have. The Holy Spirit wants to work with you, work through your conscience, work with the word and begin to get you to a place where you're stable. That you can say, this is what I believe and this is how I'm going to live. Those are called convictions. People die for that. We don't even want to be a little uncomfortable. This is a lifelong process. Sixth, a good conscience. This is what God desires for every born-again believer, a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1.5 calls us to have charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1.19, Paul instructs Timothy to hold on to the faith and have a good conscience. How do you do that? Well, I want to submit this to you. Have you ever done it? Have you ever prayed to God that you could have a good conscience? Have you ever asked him to help you with that? Obeying God's word and his will, the conscience will grow and develop. If we resist God's will and his word, the conscience will be silenced and weakened. If you're not in the word and you're starting to trip over your own skis and you're falling flat on your face and you wonder what's going on, the answer is, that you have left yourself exposed and vulnerable. You're not in the book. And given the state of people coming to church these days, not, not for any other reason than they're just too busy, you're really vulnerable. You know, like uh, 
like a navy that goes after an enemy. The navies love it when they find one ship out there on the ocean all by itself, and that's the enemy. Boy, they have a fun time bombing that thing. That becomes their target. When you're out there all on your own, when you're not in the Word, when you're not praying, you're vulnerable, and you become weak. Seven, a conscience void of offense. And use the shorthand, a clear conscience. You talk about a clear conscience. I have a clear conscience, people say. Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself always a conscience void of offense, always wanting to have a, a clear conscience. Pray for a conscience that is turned to God's will and revealed in his word. The believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit and the Spirit works through the conscience. A clear conscience produces careful Christians who are conscientious and dependable and usable in God's kingdom. God wants to take you and your gifts and use you for his kingdom. You know, we were out on the street on 31 and Walter Ferran uh, Boulevard yesterday. There was four of us out there. And as people went by, blowing their horns, waving at us, people rolling down their windows and saying, amen, God bless you, keep up what you're doing. I'd like to see more people out there with us taking a stand. It just, it, it, we're ambassadors for Christ there. And people see us out there every other week and it's beginning to take a toll on them. Oh, well, have you seen people come to church or are people getting saved? I haven't seen them come to church, but I don't know what's happening in their hearts. Not a waste of time to represent Jesus on a street corner, is it? I don't think so. In summary, a clear conscience is sensitive to the small voice of the Holy Spirit. A good conscience can make for a life of peace with God and man. A weak conscience can lead you astray. A pure conscience will strengthen your faith. A purged conscience will bring meaning and richness and purpose and peace to your life. A convicted conscience will keep you from compromise and sin and evil. An evil conscience leads to a dead conscience. No shame. And then what? What is there after a dead conscience? What's the behavior like with people who have no conscience? I've shared this story with you in the past, but I think you need to be reminded, as I needed to be reminded when I went through my book of quotes. In his book, Hitler's Cross, Erwin W. Lutzer gives chilling details about the training of the dreaded SS troops in Nazi Germany. The head of the SS was Heimlich, Himlich, uh, Heinrich Himmler, who was faced with a problem of how to take decent young German med and deaden their conscience so that they would be willing to perform ghastly deeds of cruelty. That's your job. Both Hitler and Himmler believe that each of the SS troops had to perform some deed that violated their conscience and sense of decency. Only when they did what others found to be reprehensible would they break away from their old values. The conscience had to be deadened through these acts of barbarism that would serve the dual purpose of cutting the recruit off from his past ties, his family, his friend, his church, bonding him to his new peers and his leader. The break would be so complete that he would never go back an act of torture or murder would unite him with blood brothers who had crossed the same line, felt the same numbness, and sworn themselves to uphold the same cause. The Nazis proved that ordinary people, if controlled with rigid discipline and the power of mass psychology, can be induced to carry out the most brutal and destructive crimes the human mind can devise. The troops could say with Hermann Goring, I have no conscience. Adolf Hitler is my conscience. 
How's your conscience this morning? We see how easily our entire country can be influenced to do one thing, take a, take a vaccination, wear a mask. It's not hard to see how we could be taken down any path with enough, enough influences telling us we've got to do it. Who or what is influencing you? A Christ-centered conscience, a pure conscience, a clear conscience needs to have been bathed in prayer and in the word. I challenge you this morning. I'm challenging you this morning. Get back to the book. It is your only defense against the culture of our time. Let's pray. There's power in the blood and there's power in the word. And we pray this morning, Father, that you would encourage us not just to walk out of this place and continue just like we came in, but to realize we're living in desperate times. And there is something we can do about it. We stand back and we feel like, well, nobody can do anything about this and there's no accountability, but there is. We are accountable to you. And when we, individual believers and collectively here at Amwell, put our faith, our trust, and hope in your word, we can, we can do so many things. A little bit of faith can move mountains. We can affect the lives of our friends, the people in our lives who come in contact with us every day, and they, we know that some of them are heading in the wrong direction, and, and because we know that, we can do something about it. After praying, we can speak to them when the opportunity presents itself. Help us not to let our friends and our family go to hell while we sit back because we didn't want to talk up. Show us, Lord, how our conscience is today. In Jesus' name.